Good evening. How you doing? <clears throat> I'm happy to be here at the uh, Hackenstown Library. We have some folk in the room, people on uh, on Zoom, which is wonderful. And we're going to talk tonight about the New Jersey Germans, which is um, an interesting topic. Warren County is the center of most of the German Americans in New Jersey, although there are towns all over the place. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about why the Germans came to New Jersey, what happened to them, the kind of feeling. And at the end, I added a piece on German genealogy. Should you want to trace your family? Hmm, we all do. This is, if you, that was a Jersey map, and this is the same Jersey map of 1778. And you will see we're sitting in the middle of Halperstown. And if you look a little further down here, you will see some of the other towns here, Black River. I like Suckle Sunny, and there are towns like, uh, and we'll see some older maps before, but the House of the Good Shepherd is right around here somewhere. So it's a really old map. I think about the start of Hackettstown. Now, Germans in New Jersey, and this is a book I did on it, and uh, there are several books, Irish in New Jersey, Swedish in New Jersey, through History Press, so hence we did this one. But let's take a look at German. This is the 175th anniversary of the revolution of 1848. And if you look at the, I hope you're not getting this. But I do not know. Doesn't look good. If you look in the upper corner, these are fraternity boys, which we can't see here. They have this color on their hats which today is the color of the German flag. But because the revolution started in the fraternities, they um, were forbidden to wear these hats at penalty, but they decided that Germany needed to be unified. And this was in 1848. It was not a successful revolution. It was um, a result of the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and so forth. And they were very much into liberty and defense of freedom. And Germany was a very, very divided country at that point. The Kaiser said, sure, you can have a parliament that you want, but um, I'm looking for the thing here. There we go. So this was them rioting in the streets. Many of them joined an army and got executed in a terrible time. But when Germans came to this country way before this revolution, Everybody says they come from the Rhineland Falls. Well, look at this. At this point, Germany was 305 separate countries. And to journey from the Rhineland, which is where Louis Napoleon was riding rampant, you had to uh, take quite a long journey to get out to this particular country. So we're talking about early, before the American Revolution, 17th century. Here's the journey that they took. No matter what you did, you had to come up a river. This is the Rhine, and people in lower parts would take the Rhine up to Rotterdam and then take the boat across the water. <clears throat> One problem was it was expensive, but the captains on the ship, for a lot of reasons which we'll soon discover, refused to tell you how much it cost because most people ran out of money. Because here's the Rhine River as it is today, and... Uh, in the same area. You can see there are pleasure boats on it, the cruise boats and so forth. And basically both sides of the Rhine are wine country. All of those hills there usually have grapevines on them. Come on in. Hold on. Have a seat, sure. There you go. Pull up a chair. I'm trying to stay about as loose as we can here. Time out for furniture moving. But we up to the Rhine River, which all these old German folks would get in the boat, pack up their family, and it took a lot of guts to do it. Um, okay, this is a toll booth, and there's multiple... To that, that's not the slideshow, though, Jerry. Oh, no, it's okay. We're good. We're good. My fault. This is a tower on the Rhine, and every place you go, you had to pay, every passenger had to pay to go up further. This is called the Mouse Tower. It's a very famous tower because it's um, 
Well, there was an evil king who during a famine on Long the Rhine put all the food inside the tower and um, that people were starving. So they charged the tower, pushed him inside with the grain and supposedly the mice ate him, but I don't believe that. This is another town. These are built in the 1300s and they're still there, they're standing. And then you'd pay this another one, not to be confused with the next one, not to be confused with this toll booth in Gondor or the toll cash of Stalag. And this is all backward, all along the Rhine. So you can imagine what's happening to your money. Also, look at this town. This is the town of Grimdorf, uh, the stone, the structure, and so forth. What they want to do when they come to this country is replicate or make it look like home. That That's the big thing, you know, exactly like home. This is Bendorf near Koblenz. The people from Bendorf, and this is the church in Bendorf, um, all migrated primarily to Germantown, New Jersey, which today is Old Wick. So if you look at this, this is the, my favorite town. It no longer exists. It's called Rockenfeld. And if you're from Rockenfeld, you're a Rockenfelder, which has now been changed to Rockefeller. And they came, they're German-American family. And if you look at all the names down here, this is where they came from in what in German is called a Faltz. And these are some of the Hendershot, which is all over Sussex. So, but it was a strange new world. Forget, you get off the boat, you land in Philadelphia, and you've never seen a Native American, you've never seen a beaver, you've never seen a raccoon, you probably have never seen a bear, and you don't speak the language. So this is as close as I can get to what they wore, you know, I guess in the 18th century. Probably your only outfit though, too. You probably only bathe once or twice a year. Now, what would happen if along on each of those toll booths? That Just are... wait. Okay. <laughs> and with you, you travel with your family Bible. This is a Martin Luther Bible that I found in the Sussex County Historical Society that traveled from North Carolina through Connecticut up here to Walpack. It has since been gone missing. Uh, but in the middle of these Bibles, you kept your family history. Now, Suppose you didn't have enough money. Two things happen. You would get sold. And if the family didn't have enough money, they'd sell the children or they'd sell Papa. The idea was to get as um, much money as you possibly can out of the family. And they were sold at the same auction block as um, the slaves were in Philadelphia. In fact, they'd take the children away from the parents Sell a five-year-old, whoops, he's got another problem. Yes, please. I hate to make you do this, but I need to bring a light next time. Oh, that's great. You asked the question, what happened? And I slipped the slide. That's an ad in the paper. But to be sold the time of a Negro man who they sold his time, not him, or a number of healthy German men and women they, you notice not the price. You could be indentured for life if you owed too much money. There's the auction block, the slave block. Or if you you wanted to get a five-year-old or a four-year-old so you could work them till they were 21. And you would very often see ads in the paper, German girl for sale. So it was no different. Now, many of these people became white slaves, literally, because and were often kept in the same slave quarters as the blacks. So they wouldn't get thrown off the boat. No, 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 no. Because the captain. Here, they sure. The captain was working a scam, too. And I'm sure word got out eventually, but they were all over. His... Now, New Germantown, this is an old week today. And this is the church, which looks just like the home church in Bendorf. And it was built in 1751, served a large area. More about that in a minute. And the village became Old Wick in 1918. Now, this is what the inside of the church looks like. And if you've ever been in a German Lutheran church in Germany, that's what it looks like. Pretty much the same. The pews and very simple. Mm -hmm. Now, this house is still standing. It was the home of Baldus Pickle, one of the early settlers in Germantown. And there it is later on, the old stone house, it's called. And he wrote quite extensively about it. This is the north view of Germantown in the 1700s. You can see it's, I, I was down there 
and it looks pretty much the same. Horse country. This is New Germantown back in about 1910, and it grew. And then the other town we're talking about is German Valley, which today down the street you know is Long Valley, which was sitting on the Raritan River. The Germans wanted rivers, whether it was the Delaware, the Poland Skill, Raritan, that's what they chose. This is a view, and if you're going into Long Valley over the mountain here, as you come down the hill, make a turn, that's the view. Of course, there, I don't think there are many more houses than there were then. This is in Long Valley. It's an old stone church in 1774. The site of the pastorate of Henry M. Muhlenberg, who was known as the father of Lutheranism in this country, is a graveyard there too. His son was famous for ripping off his minister's robes and revealing a Revolutionary War soldier's uniform and going into battle. Now, if you went to this church and was shared with Dutch Reform, you only went one Sunday. The next Sunday, you walked over to New Germantown, 12 miles, and went into that church. They shared a minister, who Reverend Faulkner, who came out of Brooklyn on horseback only on Sundays. The first baptism in this area was by that reverend in the house of two Black people in New Germantown. I have no idea how they got there. This is Long Valley today in the winter, and still large farmlands. Now, Zion Lutheran Church, looking very much like the other one, they claim to be the oldest. I'm not sure. It's in Long Valley. Uh, this is one of the original farmhouses. And let's get on to Stillwater, which is right down the hill here. And, and it is still looks, sometimes if you drive into Stillwater, you think time forgot. Because they have an antique car repair shop there and the old guy sitting out front drinking coffee. Not really. And um, there's a general store and post office, and it looked really, and the museum is the old schoolhouse. It's really, this is the Paul and Skill River. Now, they would wait till that rose up and take lime, um, grain down the Paul and Skill to the Delaware and onto Philadelphia. Now, this is the old, this is the, what it looks like today, and they are now trying to raise money for this grist mill to be restored. It's a national landmark and national parks, which makes it a little difficult. The original burned down in 1844, and this was built in about 1844. And they're still trying to, and Saturday is still water day if it doesn't rain. And you can go down there and visit this and do all kinds of wonderful things with the museum. This is the graveyard. And you can see in the middle is Peter Wintermuth's grave, who owns most of the houses here. And this is where the locale where the old Lutheran church was. But this is the oldest part of the graveyard. And these graves go back to pre-revolution. There's all kinds of puzzles, which makes it fun. This is Margaret Windermuthin. Now the I-N means is the feminine of the of the last name. She was she's born in 1721 and she died in 1800. And you can still see the grave there. And it's right on the edge of that graveyard. This, if you look down the street, is the Presbyterian Church which is now privately owned, and he's hoping to turn it into a museum or um, a free hall to use for meetings. This is the Casper Schaefer House, again in Stillwater. It's one of the oldest houses in New Jersey, but it's not the big one. This is what it looks like today. It's the little one on the far left. That's where they live. Now, the question is, Casper Schaefer owned slaves, both white and black, he was fairly prominent, and more about him later. There's some mystery attached to his name, too. And this is a Wintermuth house. There was a whole bunch of them. Uh, this one is a, the same house today. This is Bonnie Bray Farm, which was owned by Peter Wintermuth and has been restored with the barns and the outbuildings. And it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful spot. Now, there's an inch, this is the schoolhouse, one of the first schoolhouses in Stillwater, and what do you think the question that I get if I show it to young people is today? Did you all go to school in desks like that? I did. You know, the first question is, why is there a hole in the top of the desk? Well, of course, we all know that. <laughs> but they don't, damn, didn't mean that. Anyway, they, they always ask about the inkwell, which we, some of us remember with, Less than fond memories. They always dip the girls' braids. 
You ever see that? Yeah. And you don't want to carry that. And yeah, that stuff blotted. All right, let's move on to the moraine beams. I'm going to put my hand on the right here. Okay, you're going to hit it. These are the Moravians in Hope, New Jersey. Uh, they came here in 1769. I don't know if you Hope has Moravian houses. It's a particular cult that came out of Moravia in Central um, Europe under Count Zinzendorf. They have some very different beliefs uh, than the rest of the Christians. Their marriage ceremonies are very different, and it's really an interesting topic for another time. They're buried in the order by sex, but in the order that they die. And they have that big building. What do you want? They have choirs. The men and the women live separately. Uh, this is Hope, New Jersey from Jenny Jump Mountain, as it was back then. And they, when they started to lose money, they all bailed out and um, because they were funded from Europe. So that's more Germans here. Go ahead. Now the Hessians. What about the Hessians? We've all heard about the Hessians. And the Hessians. And that's the image we have of them. Now, this is a Hessian map, which is oh, I'm gonna stay here, which is interesting in, in the way it's laid out. This is log jail. And this map was made in Germany and French. All these little red marks are redoubts or forts. And this is the Moravian settlement, which is Hope. Log Jail is Johnsonburg, Swartzwood Lake, and Swartz Tavern. And they moved the capital of Sussex and Warren County from Log Jail to Swartz Tavern because of Indian raids. You know, if I hit the clicker, does it go forward? You can try it. Perfect. Thank you. You're good. If you look at this map, again, the Hessians, this is Boontown, Living Stone. And down here is Men Dumb. Yeah, interesting thing about this, eventually, this is all owned by the Quakers, the Religious Society of Friends. Now, why is this in French? In that because French is the international military language. And, um, and here's another problem. The Hessian soldiers were trained military. They went up by rank and earned their commission. The British soldiers bought them. Okay. Only one British general spoke German. And no German general spoke English. One of the reports they already said, we kind of guessed. You can imagine why they weren't too successful. <laughs> now this too, Sussex Courthouse is Newton today. And you see all the, the redoubts, which are little earthen forts. If you go here, you will see Caspar Schaefer's name in Stillwater on this map. The question was, was he a loyalist? A friend of mine thinks... He's a spy. We don't know. Okay, what about those Hessians? Or were they really Hessians? Um, there's George Washington conquering the Hessians. Well, they were the Braunschweigers sent 57 odd troops to North America through Canada, and 3,000 of them didn't return. The combined force of Brunswick and Hessians accounted for nearly half of Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne's British army. The other German troops came from Ansbach, Beirut, Waldeck, Anhalt, Zerbs, and Hesse. And our is always wearing these tin hats. Well, those are only the Grenadiers. Those are not all of the Hessians. But somehow, this has been warped into them being mercenaries who look like that and were evil. Well, the truth of the matter is this is pretty much what they looked like. And they were not, <clears throat> the age of enlistment was 13 years old. Many of them were 14, 15 years old. But if they deserted, they were worth more dead than alive to the Duke. And you'll see in a minute, the British paid seven pounds for each soldier. If the soldier was dead or got killed, they had to pay the British back. He could be wounded three times, too, and then they'd pay back. So we think of these hats actually were found up in Moa. And, oh, that's interesting. So... This is the map of where they all came from, and they came from different parts of Germany. Now, let's look at Braunschweig, which is up here <laughs> near Berlin. And this is the center of the town of Braunschweig today. Here's Frankfurt on mine, so you know where they're coming. Now, the problem was all the Hessians were in this half. You want some water? No, I'm good. You're good, okay. Um, here, and Frederick II would not let them march across Germany to Amsterdam to come over. So they had a march all the way up into here 
to leave um, above, not Bremen, but Bremen Begasek up here to get to this country. Now, uh, the, count, the contract for the, for the shipping of Hessian soldiers to the colonies to suppress the rebellion, the Landgrave, or the Duke, was, would sign here at the Braunschweigers. This was George III's cousin. What did they use the money that they bought these soldiers for? They were rented armies, primarily. They also fought at Culloden on the Scottish uprising. They fought at um, Waterloo and basically used the money for his clothing, his mistresses, you know, whatever he needed, some wild stories. But they were all relatives because Catherine the Great said no, Frederick II said no, I'm not lending you any troops. And George stood up in front of Parliament and they wanted to vote down. He said, let those crazy colonists be, don't go over there. No, I want them suppressed. So Braunschweig, Germany was an independent city until 1671 when the Duke actually made regiments which captured the city and ended its independence in the Hanseatic League. We don't know about independent cities. Those cities had no nobility they were self-run and they were very mer mercantile. So now we had the army and he could establish army-based schools, which is why the German military is so well-trained. Now let's, the Braunschweigers sent 4,000 soldiers, four infantry, and so forth. The troops were paid in German tailors, including two months advance pay that had taken oath to King George, and he'd be paid 7.4 seven pounds, four shillings for each Brunswick killed in battle. Three wounded men was equal to one dead man. Prince Carl would pay the British to replace the deserters of those who fell ill other than an uncommon contagious malady. Well, guess what happened? If you deserted, you got shot. We think 20 of them deserted in Stillwater and changed their names. Wow. I think they met some, the rumor is, and this is oral history, that they met some um, young ladies anyway. But here is William Ferdinand, the Duke of Brunswick, who was King George III's brother-in-law. He really tapped on his family. This is the general, Friedrich Adolf Riedessel, who suffered terribly from stomach pains. He was always sick, he had the flu. And at the battle in Bennington, Vermont, they were defeated. The German troops came through Canada, fought the Americans, and lost. They even lost worse at the Battle of Saratoga, but they did not want to be called uh, prisoners of war, they wanted to be called the Convention Army. So when they lay, they finally didn't know what to do with them, send them back to England, they're going to come back and fight with you. So let's not do that. Uh, let's send them to Cambridge. Well, they pretty well tore Cambridge mass apart. Let's get them out of here. So they're going to march them to Virginia, to Thomas Jefferson. Well, they come down through Massachusetts, and they land in Sussex, New Jersey, on Route 94 today. Uh, up near Wallkill High School, and they march down 94 to Route 519, which is down here. They go down 519 to Frenchtown and finally get to Charlottesville, Virginia, but not all of them. Many, many of them would come through a German community, find Uncle Hans or Uncle Franz, and go over the hill. And so Thomas Jefferson, it's, it's a great story for another time. This is the Baron. This is Mrs. Von Riedessel, who came by coach. When she arrived, she was pregnant. She had three children and a baby in the carriage. Was this a rough trip for her? No. They kept stopping over the weekend with this someone for dinner and that one for dinner. And uh, she was a very gifted dancer. He played, I believe, the viola. And she got bored when she got around here, so she went shopping in Easton. She kept the diary, and the one thing she leaves out completely is the entire state of New Jersey. She was bored. When they get to Thomas Jefferson, he puts them into a string quartet. By the way, Jefferson is one of two German-speaking presidents. The other one is Teddy Roosevelt. And she taught everybody how to dance. Then they went back. By the way, she had saved all the battle flags from the units and sewed them into a mattress. This is the Hessian house in Stillwater. Now, I knew people who lived here, but when World War II started, they had to move out because of the um, flack they were getting from the different neighbors, and they took all the signs off it, too. Now, I love this word. Only in German, when you get a word that long, die Überraschung. It sounds like you're clearing your throat. It means the surprise at Trenton. Now, you've all read in high school how Washington surprised the drunken Germans at Christmas Eve. Well, it's quite not the truth. Most of these soldiers were boys. They were told 
expecting an attack to sleep with their rifles in uniform. But luckily for Washington, there was a tremendous downpour of freezing rain. And these guns were fired by a spark while all the guns froze. Once Washington got there. Now, you all know this painting is huge, right? There are a few things. Emmanuel Leutzen is a German painter who worshipped Washington. They thought he was the best. So he did this wonderful painting of Washington crossing the Delaware, or was it? This American flag was not in existence till well after the American Revolution, so he could not have been carrying it. The question is, why is there a woman in the boat? There's a black man, ice flows, which are not happy, and these were ferry boats, which held 40 men. Also look at the little city in the back. There's no little city in the back. Leutze did not paint the painting here. He painted it in Düsseldorf. So indeed, Washington is really crossing the Rhine in that painting. <laughs> but see the, yeah, uh, he, you know how many pictures he painted of Washington? Continually. Washington had a problem with his picture painting. He had to stuff his cheeks because he had no teeth. And this is the picture of all these cowardly Hessians surrendering. Flags are not granted, but they're not all grenadiers. And the other piece is they couldn't fire their rifles. So 950 of them surrendered, to which the Duke said they should not have. They should have fought to the death, guns or no guns. And these were boys. Meanwhile, Colonel Rawl was not drunken. Christmas Eve is very uh, holy to Germans. And the fact is, Washington figured they'd be kind of lay back a little bit. Why don't I go? If he didn't win this battle, we'd still be in British because it was that bad. And now, 19th century and 20th century immigration. I love this picture because the coats don't belong to the people. When you went to the photographer, you put on the coat that he happened to have, and you could send it home and say how prosperous I am. All right. In 1848, V. Cum Schurz. By the way, this guy's from Phillipsburg. Uh, and Carl Schurz, who nobody seems to know much about. And it bothered me because in the way I got connected to him, my relatives, you'll see later, uh, came in 1860 to Brooklyn. Where'd you come? Well, we come at Schurz. I was born in Lenox Hill Hospital, which was the German hospital before that in the Jacoby Pavilion, who was his best friend, and my doctor had carried his, his grandfather carried shirts as coffin. So how did you come here? Well, we come with shirts. That's all you ever heard. And trust me, 95% of the people in that hospital in New York in the early 40s spoke German. My grandmother wouldn't go to any doctor, but a German doctor. So shirts been quoted in the papers, regularly my country right or wrong. In one sense, I say so too. My country and my country is the great American Republic. My country, right or wrong, if right, to be kept right, and if wrong, to be set right. So these are the two books. I just This one just came out. I'm working on a third one because Carl Schurz has been accused of denigrating the Native Americans and being anti-Black and anti-Semitic, none of which is the truth. We've just uncovered about 244 of his unpublished letters in Germany to a sister-in-law, he was getting poison pen letters because he believed that the black man should have land and the vote. And Native American, he was the Secretary of the Interior. He was a Civil War general. Quite so, he broke his um, professor out of jail after the revolution. So he's a radical reformer, an immigrant patriot, ambassador to Spain, Civil War general, senator from Missouri, and Secretary of the Interior. <clears throat> and he has been erased from our history. Henry Kissinger said, if only he had been born here, he would have been president. So here's the revolution again with the Bush and Shaft with the funny hats. And that's when Schurz had to leave the country because he was wanted. Now, the revolution was seated in this um, church in Frankfurt, which is still there. It looks like this today. It looked like that then. It was Paul's Kirchner. All the revolutionaries met there in St. Paul's Church, but today, this hall inside the church is the meeting place for a unified Germany, which I think is ironic. Schertz's plaque is on the outside. This is what it looked like when the students spoke there. Schertz was a very, very gifted orator and became a very, very close friend of Abraham Lincoln. 
Yeah, and when Lincoln lost his son Willie, Schertz sat and wept with him. Schertz was a gifted pianist who played piano for Lincoln. He was devastated when Lincoln was killed. So meanwhile, he goes into the Civil War knowing absolutely nothing about warfare with Siegel. They were at the Second Battle of Bull Run, Bull Run, and these divisions were commanded by Schenck, Adolf von Stein, and Karl Schertz, and they got blamed. The German-Americans would get blamed, or Germans, for any battle that they lost. Now, Siegel quit for that reason, and he moved to a farm, which is still there as a recreation park in the Bronx, New York. He lived on the Grand Concourse. And um, Schertz, now Schertz becomes Secretary of the Interior, he mm -hmm. the Utes. He smoked a peace pipe with Sitting Bull and was given Crazy Horse's hatchet as a symbol of peace. And the Navajos named a town in the middle of a reservation after him. Currently, our Secretary of the Interior, Native American, says he was horrible to Indian children. He was horrible to Blacks. His biggest problem was the anti-Semitism of the 1880s, where if you were a Jewish name, you could not get a hotel room. And he, because many of his friends were the very wealthy Jewish people who contributed millions to New York City, including the first public library, the hospitals. He spoke at the opening of Montefiore Hospital, and he spoke against anti-Semitism, for which he received poison pen letters. But anyway, his statue stands on 116th Street and Broadway and at Morningside Park. And these two plaques were the reason they wanted to tear his statue down. His face was done by from a death mask. This is him freeing... Um, one is the Native Americans, one is the slaves. They are unclothed, so they wanted to take it down. They did not succeed in taking it down. Um, and this is, he was a defender of liberty, quite frankly. And there's Carl Schurz Park now, where ironically they're holding demonstrations uh, for Black Lives Matter, LBGT, whatever. Now, Franco-Prussian War of 1870, Germans came in droves again over here because they'd be conscripted for military service of 25 years. That's my great grandfather, German Navy. And you served in the reserves at 25 years. This is after they beat up uh, France. Now, this is World War I. Again, this is family related. This is my grandfather. He was killed in action February, 1915. He lived next door to a painter named Bernhard Winter, or Bernhard Winter. And you can see in the picture, he fought without a backpack. And I have all his letters and a book from him. But when did this happen when you had one million men killed in World War I? Well, the next thing that happened was a terrible 1919 post-war depression. And Germans were, food was rationed. It was so bad, if you went out to the farm to get food from the farm was confiscated, that was illegal. Um, my great-grandfather wanted to walk and hired a man to walk into Oldenburg, 75 kilometers of food for the family. People were eating bread that was filled with sawdust. And then they were not handling veterans well, because after all, you lost. So what would you do? You pack up your bags, do the best you can, and come to Ellis Island. My mother, my grandmother, my aunt, my uncle all came through Ellis Island about 100 years ago. The way you did this was to marry an American citizen. My grandmother married a man she knew from her town. And when you got to Ellis Island, they lined you up and they married them one after another and everybody became citizens, as long as you were sponsored by one. Unfortunately, when she went into the Great Hall, she said, I'm not marrying him because they got the wrong guy. So they were interred for a week on Ellis Island. And yes, my seven-year-old uncle was separated from his family nightly. Nobody spoke English. When my grandmother said to him, African-American woman who was very kind to them, she said, all they could say was Morgan tomorrow. Well, eventually they got to be citizens and they moved into uh, New York. Now, World War II and the Holocaust. First of all, what did you do with all the orphan children? These are called wolf children. Uh, no parents roaming the streets of Berlin post-war. Now, this is cousin Heinrich Wilhelm. How old does he look there, 17, 16? He walked back from Russia. He burned his uniform, stole some clothes, walked at night, and hid during the day till he got back to Germany. And he lived to be about 84. But, all right. Now, 
they will put over there in displaced person camps and refugee camps, America wouldn't take them. Nobody wanted them. So eventually they were able to, uh, with the Marshall Plan, Catholic Church get over here. But there was such an influx of, of refugees after World War II. And again, like my friend down here from Freelingheisen, they were bullied badly. Now, the anti-German sentiment carried through not only because of world, the two world wars. Benjamin Franklin, 1751, said if these guttural dark-skinned people don't get back to Germany where they came from, the whole country will be speaking German. <clears throat> now, this party formed the Know Nothing Party. They believed that only Native Americans, not Native American Indians, beware of foreign influence. And they were harassing people getting off the boats. And the way they identified each other they said, what do you know? And if you said, I know nothing, they knew you're a member of the party. And look, shall American labor be protected? Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. By the way, this party still exists today as the Patriot Party. It morphed through the Democrat. And if you watch, it morphed through the Democ Democracy Party, not the Democrat. And then it became the Patriot. If you watch uh, Gangs of New York, that's where you see them. These posters after World War One, during World War One, were posted in Dover in store windows. Don't buy, beat back the Hun, destroy this mad brute. So you can imagine post World War One, nobody was too happy. Another problem: this is the fifth or sixth grade class. My mom is back here, her sister's all the way over here. The sister's fifteen, mother's twelve. What they did is they put you into a class with all the immigrants, and when you learned English, you moved up. So Aunt Julie never finished school. And this is in Greenwich Village in PS3. You can see the number of people crowded into the class, mostly Italian and German there. Now, as a result, they renamed the Frankfurter, the hot dog, the hamburger, and now it's a meat patty, sauerkraut is victory cabbage. Germantown became Old Wake, German Valley, Long Valley, German Street in Dover is Liberty Street. Hans Kuhnwald, the, the concertmeister of the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra, was in turn. The German language was forbidden. The German-American press was censored. Look at this. The poor old dachshund was known as a liberty pop. So even good German-Americans were very difficult to speak their language or to recognize their culture. Now, World War II brought anti-Nazi hatred. You know, the irony of all of this is that Adolf Hitler was the Time Magazine Man of the Year in 1935, and they've discovered the truth. This is Christmas dinner in a great hall on the sign, and we don't talk about this. They interred as many Germans in there if they feared them to be spies. We were not allowed to speak German at home because the fear was of being arrested if you were overheard. The FBI records have just been released, and neighbors were turning in neighbors, and so you didn't you didn't speak German there. My father said, no, I want English without an accent. It was not being taught in schools. Yet my neighborhood, if you walked out on a Sunday afternoon, all you heard was German. And that was from the German Jewish population. So this, they had a right to fear. This is a rally held in Madison Square in 1939 by the American Nazi Party. The guy running it, Fritzy Kuhn, was a crook, taking people's money. But even so, if you go to Andover, New Jersey, today, you see this building in Andover. It's their recreation building. You see it here. With, it's the American Nazi Bund. And, had an American Nazi party? Uh-huh. A couple times. And Fritzy, they goosed up through Newton. If, you, could you see why the Germans weren't happy? And if you go in the woods there in Andover, you can still find some swat stickers. The irony is they just started to have regular Oktoberfests in there, so. Yeah, but Fritz Kuhn was a crook. And what the FBI did is they took every license plate down and they've just published that now. Fear, if you got a German magazine or you got a letter, and in my family, the postman put the letter in the apartment letter box and you could see Hitler's stamp on it so they knew what we were. Uh, but now this is modern German, let me go back. Modern German, um, they're looking for Gemütlichkeit. This is Germania Park in Dover. Mm -hmm. And this was built by a silk mill owner, just this for men only at first. And the interesting thing about this location, this is where George Washington rode to get up to the Picatinny Arsenal area. They like German entertainment. 
this is schlockfest when you kill the pig then you have a schlockfest that's liver sausage pig's knuckles and something a smoked pork loin or a ription and they people flock to eat this stuff that i'm not fond of those and this is the only german restaurant really left it's in stanhope it's the black forest and um this is probably the only German butcher in Blairstown. He makes all his sausage in house. And what makes it distinctive is this is a butcher. There's the butcher, Roy. There's no glass here. And you can actually talk over the counter and I say, I want a steak this thick or, you know, hey, he's not cheap, but all of these wursts are made. Oh, oh my God. And you have to know that Ames is some of them too. And this is the store with the boar's head. It's still hanging there, Lanier up there and it's really and he, he's got great stuff but if you go on a saturday morning speaking german is helpful this is germania park in dover from the german americans we get oktoberfest we get the elephant from thomas nast who is from morristown and santa claus we get this bridge this is in lackawack lackawax in pennsylvania built by roebling who built the brooklyn bridge and we, we got the Brooklyn Bridge. The Conestoga Wagon is a German invention. And I love this. These are German-American descents, people you might know. It might be a bit of a shock, particularly him. I always knew he was German-American. You know. By the way, he made a whole album in German when he was a soldier. He was a soldier. Yeah. And he took a German folk song and made it a hit. But Bruce Willis, poor man, was... Out of the army when he was going in the same company. Mm -mm. Oh wow! Okay. Well, Bruce Willis is sadly ill at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. He's got yeah, he's got degenerating uh, front lobe. I think of his brain. He's not good. Mm -hmm. DiCaprio speaks German. Cruz, we know. Robin Williams, Obama's mother, Elvis, De Niro, Cher, Halle Berry, Ellen DeGeneres, Sandra Bullock is. Pretty much German, yeah. Harrison Ford, but what's in John Voigt? Now, there's some famous Germans who made Hall of Fames for different, became very famous. That would be Babe Ruth, Derek Jeter, Tom Selleck, who was an athlete, Henry Kissinger, Doris Day. This, these are from the German American Hall of Fame. Dwight Eisenhower. This is Eric Braden. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know him, mm -hmm. Victor? Yeah, from the soap opera. Yeah, well, you know, the what's that? Young and the Restless. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But so that's awkward. he. Um, I met him out in um, Wisconsin, I guess. And here's the sad story with him. His real name is Hans Gudegast, which he yeah. did the Rat Patrol years and years ago. And until he changed his name, he couldn't get any more work. Mm -hmm. And um, his father was SS. And he came here as an athlete to play on an all Jewish soccer team. You figure it out. Now he's up, he's just recovered from bladder cancer and has gone public with it. But uh, he said he's recognized as Victor all over the world. And Babe Ruth, George Steinbrenner, Amelia Earhart, these are all partially or mostly German American. Now, I, I added some stuff. If you're interested in finding your German roots, how I went about it, think that might be a good story in our family. If you have my last name, which means bright light of the leads, you're related. I found relatives, in the, I'm very lucky, in the phone book and so forth. This is a coat of arms. We're not too sure if it's real or one of the Lubrechts drew it. Originally, the name was Von Lubrecht, and it was a Bohemian knight as far back as I could go. All Germans during World War II had to carry an unensoffel of their background mm -hmm. to prove that they were not Jewish. My family, this is from South, didn't want them anymore. So they had, I donated most of them to the Bronx High School of Science Holocaust Museum. And I, and this is just a photo of one of them. You want to see the ads on the back. They're not pretty. Mm -hmm. Then my mom and dad, who came here, she came 1922. Pop came 1928. No English. 19 years old. Then I found this picture. This is my great-grandfather, but that's my grandma, my home mom. Mm -hmm. When she was about seven, it's in, from East Frisia. Now, my parents met at Camp Forestburg, New York, all German-American camp. The premise was if you went there, you got a camp name. Nobody knew what you did. Nobody knew how much money you had. 
It's very strictly run. Men had to wear tops on the beach. My dad got thrown off the beach for being topless. And he didn't like that. But this is the lake as it was then. It's now a Boy Scout camp. And there are all the happy campers. This is my Uncle, Fr uncle Fritz. Everybody has an Uncle Fritz, Aunt Julie. And they all met up there. And they'd stay up for their two-week vacation. Remember those years? And just have a good old time. A campfire, sing-along, marshmallows, no liquor. And this is the, all the family that I've rounded up, including, I mean, this is my Uncle Carl fighting in the 755th tanks against the Germans who, uh, you know, against the army that his father died for. This is my grandfather, and the building is still in Reitling, and he designed. Uncle Willie got killed three months after his brother, my grandfather. My Aunt Ilse was the mistress of a Nazi tobacco maker next door to you-know-who in Bechter's Garden. Aunt Ruth sang on Nazi radio. Henrik Willem was in the Luftwaffe. Hans Meyerhoff, cousin, was killed. Lubrecht was killed. He's a Nazi officer. Uh, but these three are a puzzle. We married outside the faith a lot. They were shot in the back of the head by the Nazis on the way to Auschwitz. So I've covered all the bases. And it's really hard to find. You can get pictures like this. This is circa, I, I love to find things like this. This is Brooklyn around 1900. This is Charles T. Lubrecht. This is my aunt, uh, cousin, Auntie Florence and her partner. She's one of the few alternative lifestyles of people. I thought it was Auntie Florence and Auntie Marion, but what did I know? This is 1904. They're always pictured huddled or holding hands. And I have more in Germany where they had a, a female partner and always the same thing. This was Charles C. Lubrecht's picture of the Brooklyn Bridge, which he's a lithographer. This is where I, I found this. A relative gave me this family history. This one I found online in eBay or somewhere. It's written by Karl Lubrecht, who was the postmaster of Berlin in 1936. And inside was the family history going quite, quite a ways back. Now, the records from Ellis Island on the archives are now free online. So if anybody came through there, now Ellis Island opened around 1898. They came through Castle Island first, and then it shut down in 19, I want to say 38, and then opened again after World War II. And the records are good. You can use a family tree maker, which I do, because then this will search the net for you. And you can get anybody you want. And this is the archival information. They've reorganized them all in Germany, and they're incredible. You can get into the archives. You pick an area you like, type in the last name, and they'll tell you if there are any of the folks there. So I was able to find my grandmother with a baby picture. This is a puzzle. This is my great-great-grandmother and her husband, and this is where my line stops. I don't know what happened to him. He was a captain, died in 18, for, uh, and died at age 48, and that's all I know. So that's kind of a personal cap. Uh, sorry about the uh, technical glitches that we had here, but maybe uh, I'll figure it out next time. Do you have any questions? If not, okay.